Thank you, Lisa, for the intro. Again, my name is Liang Zhao. Uh, I'm the division director for quantitative method modeling, office research standard, ODD. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed your lunch and uh, um, also enjoyed all the previous uh, talks regarding uh, different dosage forms, uh, regulatory recommendations, uh, strategies for different route administrations. So I'm going to do a short opening uh, to show how quantitative, quantitative method modeling can be used uh, in terms of proposing an alternative or novel um, uh, strategy uh, for, uh, to establish BE in terms of how to uh, um, uh, develop our uh, product-specific guidances, how to address things that happen when we use modeling simulation to address some of the review issues. So after my talk, we'll be uh, we'll do a, a quick introduction about the role of modeling simulation for new and generic drugs. And then I will move on to uh, current utilities of quantitative clinical pharmacology and a physiologically based pharmacokinetic models on the regulatory issues. Then I will do a quick introduction for the cases that going, that, that's going to follow my talk. The use of advanced quantitative method and computation modeling have become part of modern drug development and assessment for new drug. I hope everyone is familiarized with the term model informed drug development, which is one of the key initiatives in the FUDUFA 6 um, uh, negotiations and the uh, uh, agreement. Uh, the idea is that for generic drugs, can, given the accumulation of data and knowledge, can we even make the modeling impact bigger? So I will introduce MIDD and our model integrated evidence, th this kind of a concept in my um, following slides. So what is model informed drug development? Is uh, using modeling simulation as a power tool, powerful tools to guide drug development, and they can support development review division makings. The scope of application uh, is dependent on the data sufficiency and the existing knowledge. Uh, in the new drug side, MID is mainly used for, uh, to inform clinical study design, dose optimization, and those adjustment for pediatric population uh, in the event of DDI uh, for specific populations with organ dysfunctions, et cetera. So, uh, but however, the modeling simulation generated data cannot always substitute for the required basic level of a clinical evidence in the new drug development, especially for NMEs, new molecular entities. So can we make the uh, modeling simulation impact further, as I just said, with the further gaining of knowledge data through, uh, throughout the course of the product development life cycle? So can then we have a um, concept of model integrated evidence is to use virtual B study result, not just to plan a pivotal study, but also to serve as the pivotal evidence for product approval. Uh, MIE can be used in combination with relevant in vitro testing to support alternative to otherwise recommended conventional in vivo studies. It's come down to a integration of a knowledge and a predictive performance of the model for the intended modeling purpose. In the following cases, you hope you can have a good appreciation how this concept can be realized in generic drug uh, development and review. Only information that's the combination of uh, science and knowledge and is sufficiently supported, validated, verified by but the data can be uh, classified as uh, model integrated evidence for regulatory decision making. 
we just mentioned a virtual B study. It's a, a major form of how the model integrated evidence being generated. It's to use model to compare test and reference formulations in the realm of a generic drug development. The model must have a formulation variable or variables that can be used as a modeling input to um, represent the difference between the test and reference product. The model can also generate a population um, to compare the test reference product in, the, in a simulated, simulated virtual B study. Certainly, we can gen generate them, uh, as many as, uh, as you, uh, population as you want in the virtual BE testing. There are two classes of tool set that's being used um, to generate the model integrated evidence. And, uh, have, uh, and can be used to uh, inform regulatory decision makings. The first class goes to uh, quantitative clinical pharmacology, QCP. QCP has not, not, not only been used to inform a B study design, but also um, uh, be uh, used to deal with data set, B data set of unique structures. So we assess bioequivalence based on PK, PD, or clinical endpoint, and or clinical endpoint. In that regard, so can we, we are dealing with uh, special situations where the PK data is very sparse. In that case, we can use uh, population PK model to figure out, even with the sparse data, what the overall PK curve is like. Uh, for example, for ophthalmic, um, Topical drug application. So um, we earlier in, in the sessions we mentioned the difficulty facing developing long-acting injectables uh, in terms of uh, uh, long time, uh, uh, long study duration, and uh, larger size, uh, larger sample size because of uh, population variability. In that, uh, with that, we can also use modeling. Uh, population PK modeling to uh, make the bridge to counter the challenge. When we're using PD endpoints to uh, assess bioequivalence, uh, we are dealing sometimes dealing with uh, a dose scale analysis, and we want to uh, select a PD endpoint that is sensitive to a dose change in terms of rate and extent of a drug delivery to the site of a drug action. So in that regard, can we, which PD endpoint is more sensitive, sensitive to tell there is a dose difference? So we can use P, uh, PKPD models to uh, inform uh, alternative study design. For example, if we, based on the time course of the PKPD or exposure response relationship, we know that at an earlier time point, we can see a separation of clinical response or PD response following different doses, we can just design a study, um, make an evaluation at the earlier time, time point rather than uh, uh, like a 24-week study. You can use a four-week study if you think you have enough justification that at four weeks, there's a, a desirable separation of PD or clinical response for following different doses. Certainly, we can use uh, comparative clinical endpoint uh, 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 evaluation based on uh, trial simulations. So we conduct a study uh, in a manner that could be different from what the PSG has recommended. In that case, if the model can be sufficiently verified, we can use the model to simulate a study scenario that's been uh, in line with the uh, in, in agreement with the PSG recommendation. So certainly we can use PKPD analysis or exploratory res response relationship to make BE recommendations, like what metric we can use to assess uh, the bioequivalence. If, for example, if the product has very steep exploratory response relationship for clinical uh, outcome, uh, the product can well much be falling into the category of uh, 
narrow th therapeutic index drug. In that case, case, we do have a relatively tighter BE uh, control. We can also evaluate whether the uh, partial EOC, part of the area and the, the curve for concentration can be more predictive of a clinical efficacy, sometimes safety. In that regard, we do have a partial EOC uh, as the additional B metric in our product specific guidance recommendations. We can certainly use model based B assessment. Uh, the scenario is that for in cases like uh, uh, LAI, so or other difficult, uh, difficult um, uh, complex generics, uh, if the model has been sufficiently va validated by the data, and uh, the B that is really difficult to, uh, to be conducted in, in real life, then we can use the model to simulate the scenarios uh, you would like to uh, see in real life. For PVPK model, it belongs to the second class of the tools that we usually resort to in, B, in current B assessment. So PVPK models can be used to identify the critical quality attribute and identify the bio-predictive dissolution method. Uh, they are, they, they, these are the hot topic that I uh, even yesterday uh, at the, another uh, PVPK workshop um, uh, just next door. So PVK model can be used to determine the appropriate systemic PKB metric to ensure equivalence on local drug delivery at the site of action. So we all know that you know, following topical use or following inhaled use, it's really hard to have a concentration a PK sampling at the site of action in the lung or in the thermal area, in the ophthalmic, uh, uh, in the eye. So, so in this case, we can uh, uh, we can use PVPK modeling to incorporate all the knowledge, all the physiological parameters known to have assessments of a local drug delivery. We can use uh, PVPK models justify difference in quality attribute and in, in vitro testing result from a reference list of product. Uh, sometimes we do face, we do not know whether the product is exactly uh, Q2 or not. For Q1 part, it's fairly easy to be uh, in line with the, uh, the requirement. So if there is a deviation, can we also use the PVPK model to justify any deviation in this kind of a Q2 uh, parameters. Um, we can also uh, conduct uh, virtual BE studies to evaluate the effect of formulation difference based on PVPK model, especially for locally acting product. Uh, we do have a common uh, three paper published a PSV regarding how to verify or validate the model for regulatory use in this, uh, in this regard. Um, we can certainly uh, use PVPK model to guide the selection of a clinically relevant in vitro testings for BE. This is kind of a uh, repetitive or in line with uh, the first bullet point. So the case studies uh, today um, will be focused on how modeling is being used for to develop PKBD based uh, product specific guidance how we use modeling to uh, uh, help uh, and uh, uh, review consult, and how to use PBBK models uh, to support not conducting comparative clinical endpoint study, which is costly um, uh, uh, to establish B equivalence. I think my time is up. Without further ado, I will uh, pass the podium to uh, following presenters. I'll see you again in the panel.